Welcome. Good to see all of you here. I'm Kimberly Nightingale, and I'm the executive director of the St. Paul Almanac. And it is the day after Christmas, and it's cold. My California friends and relatives think we're crazy to be here and not there. Um, if you haven't heard of the St. Paul Almanac, uh, we publish your stories, your poetry, your lives in our book. And we publish them every year. So if you're interested in sending work in, we've extended the deadline to December 31st, and uh, mail your stories into stories at stpaulalmanac.org. I want to give a big shout out to the Black Dog Cafe, if we can give them a round of applause. <laughs> the Black Dog's been sponsoring our Lower Town Reading Jams for many years, and I would ask that you support them by buying a drink, eating their food, and keeping them going. It's been a tough struggle here with the light rail closing down their streets for about two years. <clears throat> This activity is made possible in part by funds provided by the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council and the Lower Town Future Fund of the St. Paul Foundation, the McKnight Foundation, the St. Paul Mardig and Bigelow Foundations, Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, KFI, KFAI Radio, and of course, our wonderful St. Paul Neighborhood Network. SPNN airs our shows throughout the month on their cable access channel. And we would also like to do a special thank you to Takuma Aiken, our incredible artist in the front here. <laughs> Takuma draws the action as it's happening. Tonight's show is titled, By Chance, By Choice, Radical Writings on Family. And our curator tonight is Amy Renault. Amy Ooh, strives, yeah. woo! Amy <laughs> strives to be full of joy. Winner of the Urban Griot's New Spoken Word Artist of the Year Award in 2009 and recipient of the 2011 Verve Grant for Spoken Word Artists, Amy occasionally likes to read her poetry out loud and hopes to spend the next year learning how to effectively foster her creative tendencies. When she isn't getting paid to sling espresso for motorcyclists, she can usually be found playing with boisterous kittens, devouring the pastryarchy, reading books, traveling everywhere, sending letters, and trying sometimes desperately, yes, to feel free. Please welcome Amy Renault. Now I'm very embarrassed. <laughs> Didn't think that was going to be read out loud, but all right. Um, welcome. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight, to have had the opportunity to be here tonight, to have had the opportunity to invite all of these poets um, to perform their work for you um, today, yay, the day after Christmas. So um, just to speak a little about our theme, um, we picked it mostly because today is the day after Christmas, and I didn't want it to be a holiday-themed poetry show, but I did want the emphasis to be, you know, like related to the season, um, but perhaps not in the traditional way. So yeah, the poems tonight will be mostly about family and maybe some not about family, because I said that was okay too. Um, and the poets tonight are all really fantastic and I've known most of them for a very long time and really love them so much. Um, yeah, thank you again for coming and thank you St. Paul Almanac for inviting us to do this. Um, our first poet of the night, I'm going to bring up Denez Smith to the stage. Um, Denez is from St. Paul. He's currently working in Madison. Um, if he had a spirit Pokemon, it would be Squirtle. And um, he says he's a regular contributor to his mother's fridge door and awkward poems at family gatherings. So perfect for tonight. Please welcome Denez Smith to the stage. Hi, y'all is. Good, 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 good. How are y'all doing? Good. Good, all right, cool. I'm like a pastor. I expect boisterous responses to that question. All right. Uh, my name is Denez. I live in Madison, Wisconsin. I've been living there for a long time, but I'm St. Paul, born and raised. Uh, it's been the first time in a long time that I've done a reading here in St. Paul. I was supposed to have a couple more that got canceled. Um, but like, yeah, it feels really good to like be home and be reading poems that are sometimes about poem. Um, I miss you. I miss you. OK. Uh, but it's like, you know, Facebook is like, you know, digital, you know, Selby Avenue. So I'd be seeing that. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so yeah, Chosen Family. Um, I'll do a couple poems of not about that, a couple that are, a couple about my like 
actual family who I think you still have to choose in a way um, because it's very easy to say hell no to your grandma. Uh, not easy to do without getting slapped, but easy to do. Um, so yeah, let me start off with this poem. I just wrote it last night um, because I was like, I don't have anything about my friends before I found other things about my friends, so I wrote a poem. Um, it's called All the Lights for Blair, Krista, Kim, Kelsey, Tish, Carl, Andrew, Lorena, Moira, Nico, Dialin, Camilla, and too many more. And when my body and my blood are distant or distant, I swell with light, veins thick with watts, easy flames, bizarre stars, a single God with too many names. For you, I've grown a second mouth to amen for eternity. It prays and prays and never smells like smoke. It never asks me for food or water or flesh. Its teeth are neat and ivory with holy always in its mouth. But let me stop trying to write a poem. Let me get drunk again. Let me turn off the music and speak too loud. If you will pause your twerk, I will give you my heart wrapped in a Philly, sparked and burning. I've never been good at love. I fake it until it flies or ashes. Pardon my poor man's phoenix. I am only a robin obsessed with fire. Still, if you need it, I will muscle my way into legend. Shoulder the whole falling sky just so you can light your cigarette. Beat up a gang of gods if they treat you too rough. Now go drink my house dry. Show the earth how drought is done. If you need me to hold your hair back, I will. If you need me to, I will. If you need, I will. If you, I will. If I will, I will. Word. One more. Ah. Poems about things. Oh, speaking of my grandma. So my grandma's a G, right? Um, like OG. Um, if you don't know what OG stands for, um, it's original gangster. Um, so yeah, my grandma, she, she holds it down. Um, and I've always tried to write a poem for her. And it's been really hard. Um, but she's had a hard life. And yeah, so I tried to write a poem for her. And then sidetrack, I've been watching a lot a lot of Game of Thrones lately, and so like there's been castles in a lot of like the new things I've been writing. Um, so yeah, this poem is hella castles. Um, it's called Royal Royal for Barbara Smith. From you we learned a simple magic. How to build a castle from ruins and hairpins. How to turn one pea and two bones into a feast. How to arrange the letters, the letters in the word common into majesty. From your unsecret secret marched an army of girls made of rusted armor, new bodies born briefed on the king's blood oath to violence, you raised them to fight a different war. A lifetime spent rebuilding the sky every day the king remembered his fist when his split knuckles craved intimacy. Legend says that the queen, is this the first time someone's called you a queen, woke to wake the sun, prayed over her humble kingdom, left to work at the battery factory, at the school, at the airport, face painted back to brown, a cheap, expensive looking scarf wrapped tight as hands to hide your black and blue collar. By the time I learned to fall, the king was acquired a rage. A toothless wolf dependent on the doe's hunt, and you were still queen, content on seeing set what you had dawned, still loyal to the king's throne after he was replaced by dust. Your grace, your amazing grace, before I misplaced my mouth and my hands abandoned me, you must know this. I love this life fiercely. I thank God every moment I can for breath, for water, for blood, I am forever in your debt for turning the thorns into cotton, for teaching the fire breather to only sing smoke. But if you had run, spun yourself into the night for good, went back to your own grandmother's home before you made the one who made me, I wouldn't mind. If you were safe, I would rejoice in my shapelessness. Before I was crowned with lungs and skin, I was the voice you heard making, while making your dungeon a palace, whispering, go. Go, go. Um, so I'm gay and I really like doing that, being that, it's like cool. Um, you get to wear rainbows and nobody can really say shit to you because you're like, I'm fine. Um, but yeah, uh, but I don't like have a lot of gay friends and a lot of my friends also happen to be cute so sometimes I like awkwardly fall in love with straight boy friends and then I write poems to try to write it out. I don't like this guy anymore, which is really good because he's like a brother, but you know, not a brother, then he'd be like kind of incesty, which is 
okay for some people, but not for me. Um, so yeah, this is like one of those poems that I wrote to like get over crushes that I have on my keyboard. It's called Covet. In the latest dream, you're a knife. I'm bread. Jesus is there, feeding me to the world, but it's none of my business. I'm too busy with my own holy. The more you take, the more I give. On days I wake in a rush to fall back asleep where you wait on a bed of hands. I chant, speak easy given skin, it's pro prohibition. I am a devout Christian, the pastor is my hero. I will be the image of glory himself, flesh roven from ivy cloth. But my mouth isn't an honest thing unless the question is gin. He craves the stain. I swore I'd never be one of those tragic queens, stumble post over men who were never boys tucked in the corners of locker rooms, too afraid to look and not look. But here I go, tragic. My mornings engrossed with the backs of knees, elbows, where your leg becomes your other leg. What parts of you hold the most salt in a past life? You were a wolf. I served loyal in your pack. We feasted, we, I, while we feasted, our god moon imbrued red in the sheen of your fang. I envied the dough that we hallowed in the presence of your breath or the curve of your palm. I chant my ace, my brother, my dog, my homie, my nigga, fam, right hand, brother, from another, born from some matter thicker than water, thicker than blood or iron or whatever else makes anatomy possible. I pipe dream, miss the bus. Hopeless to be your kind of sin, to trouble the air around your neck, waiting in the cold, I chant, no. Twice in the dark, I thought to trade bodies with the girl that you had gotten fly for, but I couldn't have discovered your flesh while still learning hers. I want you this life, this form, and about before. I have no place to say that you never peeked across a room or across a still twitching dinner, but in this life, whatever you wondered about jaw lines and shoulders, you've never sought with your hands. And if your hands knew anything, they were not given mouths for a reason. I'm afraid. Next time I say your name, I'll scream it. Uno mas. All right, cool. Um, I write a lot about sex, disclaimer. Oh, I guess the disclaimer is supposed to come up before. Um, but yeah, I do. Um, it's kind of like an attempt to like, you know, reclaim that mess. Because, you know, we don't talk about sex enough, especially in Minnesota. You know, I feel like sometimes, you know, like my, my grandmother, and she says, oh, no. And I say, oh, yeah. And, you know, we all do it. That's how I got here, you know. Um, <laughs> but um, OK, not Minnesota. I should try this poem in a Minnesotan accent, though. Nope, for next time. Um, so. I go to church, and like my church family is real important to me, but um, often they say things that I very, 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 very much don't agree with. Uh, I won't get into all those things um, right now. But one time I went to church, and the sermon was about how it's very wrong to use the Lord's name during sex. And I said, that's almost impossible, one. And two, I'm going to write a poem about that one day. So this is the poem I wrote about that one day. Um, it's called Blasphemy. I've never known an orgasm not to be holy. You try and siphon your, uh, you try and siphon a sweet name from your blood and not thank the Lord for endless rows of skin, begging someone to run, to seed, to harvest a tithe of teeth. See, the body is a temple filled with Holy Ghost thick as good cream. Filled with people who have risen from the pews dancing far too close, far too slow. This might not be dancing at all, but that music, the steady headboard like a thousand believers rejoicing, raising the dust to raise the spirit, spin body and mouth to something inside that demands out in church. You ain't lived until you've been made, Gail. Out thundered the storm at the window until lightning takes shelter in your body. Paradise lost, now found in the back of your throat. See, I shout, oh my. God, for a reason. When my glory comes, my mouth snatches something to lure me back to body, and for me, that's heaven. Ain't gotta be God for you, it could be all 
global warming, uh, oh, holy coupons, uh, oh, my sweet veganism, when each sale is a war suddenly at peace, when you are dizzy and drenched in their sweat, when your mouth is filled, when their mouth is filled, when what needs to be drained is drained. Let the first word after be praise for the possibility of skin, the gospel of nipples and earlobes, the promise of nails in your back fat. See, I dare you to watch a really boring movie with your lover. Get tired, put your head in his lap, fall asleep to the loyal churns of belly and heart. Thank y'all so much, appreciate it. <laughs> and I have like bookie thingies for sale. I don't think I've read anything out here, but I have like credit card and cash. Holla at me after the show, I'm broke, peace. We clap one more time for Danez, please. <laughs> um, the next person I'm gonna bring to the stage is someone very close to my heart. Um, Melinda Lee is a queer person of color, clock dog, activist, artist, quietly dismantling systems of oppression one at a time. Please welcome to the stage, Melinda Lee. When my mother asked me to be her Facebook friend, I did not think I would recognize her. If it weren't for her clothes, I might have mistaken her for old skin, stubborn faucet singing for no reason. I have stopped dreaming about her, abandoned what used to be, and have taken it for what it is, a crippled lightning, a toothless coward daffodil sleeping. I am my own bones. <coughs> to this day, she has mistaken me for hers, marked me as her dependent, our cross-hatching genes, but a which way for government welfare, used my name without permission, stolen photographs of me, and called me her own, claiming to have made me possible. Mother, I should be dead if it weren't for the magic of crashing stars. You were the reason behind me so recklessly and fighting like a dog. Mother, I fought like a dog, torn so much skin, and picked at the scabs, not giving a fuck about how I scar. Ma, look at my scars. Half of them are to show how alive I have been without you, how my heart still boils every time something tastes of love. Mother, you are my only one, though I have not forgotten your teeth at our hearts, your midnight stilettos drumming our heads, liquor spinning on the ceiling, on your breath, the salt of your tongue after the swine of his hands, and the feathers of a thousand doves could not compare. I wish I could have known you at 10, when everything was as simple as a kite. Or at 15, when arrogance could be justified, you look older than you are these days. Perhaps a decade of silence has created a callus on your heart. Perhaps I have done wrong. I cannot help it. It would be false to love you any other way. When I think of home, I cannot think of a place. When I think of home, I cannot think of a place. If it will be anything, it is ashes in my hands. If it will be anything, it is ashes in my hands. When think is it will be of, uh, of home, I cannot think. If I place anything in my, ash my hands, it ashes. If you are anything, you are a cacophony of sand. If you are anything, you are a cacophony of sand. If I am anything, I am a broken smoke. If I am anything, I am a broken smoke. Anything you are, you are. If I am a sand, smoke, a cacophony of anything. If I am broken, I will swallow a harvest of violins. I will swallow a harvest of violins to know something other than thunder, to know something other than thunder. Then other, I know to swallow the thunder of violins will harvest something. Think of something, anything. Think of a place. If my, if, if, if it is of a smoke, it will swallow in your harvest to the broken thunder. 
If you are anything, I am sand. When I am home, I will be a cacophony of ashes. Violins cannot know anything other than hands. My last one. Thanks, Amy and um, St. Paul Almanac for putting this uh, show together. There are words that endure the velocity of time. They do not rust or flutter or disappear on the tongue. They do not apologize for their swallower's stow. They never clutter the heart or the mouth. They do not shatter in the wind. They flame. They flame recklessly and tirelessly and over and over and over again. of the evening is a poet from South Minneapolis, a poet and rapper, currently succeeding at quitting his job. Um, <laughs> Chance writes poetry based in radical anarchist politics, read love, and critical race theory. He is also a member of the Minneapolis-based budding rap glasses audio perm and a smaller rap group, Art School Girls. Please give it up for Chance Erlin. <laughs> The one guy trying to uh, get his laptop to bounce on the mic stand, so y'all can bear with me real quick. It's all right, it was cheap. I am lucky. Worried murmurs from the audience. Yeah. It'll be okay. I'm gonna do it with one hand. I got 20 and it's all okay in the end. Um, so I just dropped out of college. Thank you. It's a good decision for me. How you doing, love? And um, I just dropped out of college and I've been trying to like get back into, into poetry and in terms of like a community that is not dictated by being able to like spend $60,000 a year in order to work with like some cool poets out in New York and things like that. You know, not to hate, but I've been doing a couple of readings in the city and um, trying to dialogue, trying to build, build it. And today, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna hold it with my hand because I'm not gonna do the whole thing. And today, like, I'm trying to say something really profound here. It's just, I'm a poet. And, and like, like a lot of times, like going into this sort of stuff, I feel really, I'm not gonna, ramp through the whole set just for a second. I feel really nervous. I feel like, what am I doing here? I'm like, this is what I do. Like, when I'm sad at 3 a.m. or like, I've only had two beers, what am I thinking? But honestly, I am really humbled to be a part of this tonight after only the first two. Um, so thank you so much for having me. This is called Safe Zone. The perception of beauty is a moral test. That was the to allow them their own words, despite the insistence of action. We've built a house in the arsenic-laden soil on Lake Street, making prayer from liquor, providing whatever kneeling provides you. This is night in the after and ever. Slurring down single speeds, taco trucks hum along us, carrying on the insistence of action. This is triumph. It is chicken thawing in sinks, lending to leather tanning in the ether and thin fingers, stripping time into spitting grease. We've been hazarding guesses at substitutes for 7-Up and the compatibility of cooks in this country. However many women building while bones broke in the kitchen along 24-hour soaks and summer broiling the Lord's work. However many houses and doors, the same streets and walks, the houses, the routes, the helixes stringing along the fascia between the skin and the meat. I don't know if that's Tagalog or my father's massaging it with salt. I was not taught to cook with beef or pork. 
deep fried lumpia maybe, sausage caramel sweet blackened with shrimp complete with shell still. You'd normally let it marinate for two hours, he tells me, but Erlins like to suffer, so leave it in the fridge for 24. The rare occasion his lover would cook for him, I called it some tiny victory and little revolution. Mornings, I am dizzying to the market, venturing for eggs, woken by beans, grinding in the halls. Thank you. I tried to write that poem for a while and be like, oh man, like, I learned heterosexuality and cooking from the same man. That's weird. And then I was cooking with a friend from Pittsburgh, and she's like, oh, you're a kitchen top. You're just a kitchen top. And I was like, I'm uncomfortable. But um, don't cook with me. Um, you can do the potluck thing. Thanks for that tweet. Um, this is called Bayani. The old world will die so that the new world will be born with less sacrifice and agony on the living. That's from America is in the Heart by Carlos Bolusan. I imagine my grandfather in some third world fantasy putting his hand on my father's shoulder before he took some 50 style yellow cab to some small runway, some small plane, some small Babylon, some Chicago again the plane landing and cowering beneath the city's name. When I flew to Los Angeles with him, we rented a four-door and drove around for hours. Cool desert night I can't remember in the blind Los Angeles blacktop bounding. You see that building? That's where Colette told me she was pregnant. Told me we were pregnant with you. An old friend of his sat up with me late that night, going through a box of photos, trying to find my father, sleeping a few rooms over, or hiding in the bottom of a cigar box. This is chance, she tells me. And I see her sitting on the floor of some empty apartment, tying a pale yellow serpent around her forearm, tail in her left hand, kissing its fangs, nodding off on the hardwood. Jesse, a namesake is like a flight the second you step through a metal detector, you are patted down. The officer is just as tired, smelling like Nevada, Minnesota, Georgia, looking like Missouri. You're waved through effortless, but I hear the Midwest is nice this time of year, and you become the same. A protocol carded and dropped. Walking on the tarmac, dropped like waking, dropped. Lost your mind between the tasers, the takeoff, the descent, the rotundas, the taxi. Here you are. And while the fragility may still curse and flex, enduring, the sight line will sleep with you, bend as wrought iron in the hands of him, be the city's difference. It's the sacred land under graffiti masquerading as a window seat. Jesse, wherever you land, the prodigal has been here before, made this. But the middle child, I named him Dad. Forget Julius as in Caesar and his brothers, the greats, Napoleon, Ferdinand, Alexander, Derek. I know each of them is Kuya. I named them, retired from one military mind, beating each other's teeth in prodigies in violence, free pass from one world to the next, apple pie served to Filipinos, full mouth, speaking the language it tastes of, garnished with medals and memorials. Years and years and years of bullets, whistling, floating, just hummingbirds watching. Or was it she, her lying, a bed in some suicide wing on the west coast, overlooking some hidden beach, their sister we call her Emma, Immaculata Concepcion, deflowered, beaten into the sand of her same beach, her brothers and crucified, a product of lust, which is vengeance and slavery. Everything in the name of the one brother who did not land stateside with shaky legs and the false confidence of flight. He was called redemption. And he must be missing an epitaph. A white cross just reaches his brother's chin, buried at 12, maybe embraced by his city and crowned king in waiting. A resurrection in Catholicism, in contraction, scream, breathe, count, don't, push, 
Yet inside my Mississippi night, I dream of them as bullets already born in unison, lying to me, names but words, calling me their own, whistling, floating. Baby, be gracious. See how he flickers? Fall off the edge. Get gone. Rest in custom and thanks with less cultured men. Go with God. I am her, Emma, knowing her as I see her. She telegraphs the father Mars, stop. The poet of cities and flights, stop. Drunk and in love, stop. The same cigarette that won the war, dangling, stop, dangling, stop. Playing whiskey solitaire, you diamond back. The half-brothers visit him and can't keep up to his mantra. I stopped drinking, but now you're here. I've stopped sending remittances back home. And now you're here. Mars, I know you as Bayani. Man is an island chain. Thank you. Um, three more short ones. We get on time for that? Cool. Um, this is about trying to be happy again. Recovered from the flood. Not much more than a portion of blanket for you when this river's too much and the car is ambered in grain. Perhaps a bite if I'm up to it. Most months I was concerned with cancer and how tall our buildings were, which warehouse the freaks would find this week, what makes a skyscraper skyscrape, where the suits would pull the streets from their roots or barb the banks of the river tonight. Not wealth or what photos and drawings imply anymore. Not which city's cops you could trust. Just where to smoke and trip and make dizzies when funnier deliriums would skip. The family's glad about the running starting up again. Eager to feed me in any return they can get. Not as used to my asking for the skates, not the ore. After emptying buckets in the basement of pollen. Thank you. Uh, this is called Cedar Trees. Tonight we stain our faces with fire water. To the edge, to the toast. To the red man's reservation in Little Earth, between the tenements and the south side, Hiawatha Lake liquors, our castle, our, our plunder, in the streets of Mogadishu, they dream of this bedlam. Your father work hard, works hard, says the mother, half lying. But his woman is closer. At 20 and house broke, 12 stories up on the west bank, the river divides. Sweet laundry lofts down like a dream overhead, and a dobo cooks slow in the kitchen is ready. Coming off the highway from behind the clouds, whiskey sings through, starts swinging. The day's dress rides up and my turn comes to steal a glance or a touch if I'm lucky. Thank you. Uh, this is the last one. Uh, thanks so much for having me again. We got on time. Everything's cool. All right, this is my last one. If I can find it. If anybody wants to donate a printer to the cause. <laughs> We are trying to change things out here. <laughs> oh, thank you, Huey. <laughs> Officer down. The West Coast don't know it like we do in our little snow globe. As when you enter the essay at university and the gook cop give you a half nod. When you leave Frogtown and the monk kids all mug you or cipher. You eat free some days at Jasmine if the nice Vietnamese speaks to you like a child. It makes her husband happy. Perhaps their son hadn't been anywhere in years. Okay, says the surrogate, like an effigy burning there. And the first time you hear gunshots, pray it's the writers from East Lake, not the shields from the district who aimed always much better the way fire, that rope can be better, that fire is supreme. Instead, Julius is crying in the kitchen with his sharp suit on his way through. 
The city will find us if we don't wash the Sir Tracy tag off the garage by the first. The squad cars just squeal. Julius gives his brother his gun back. Was it the six shots that missed the SWAT team he'd read of? The wrong chinks at the business end all slept in one room. A child, an infant, a man with his wife who were shot at in rounds with the glint of his gun shone and somehow all 40 or 100 missed with the six fired in the right to intrusion. Or the mung pig who'd been found out in plain clothes and assaulted by some runner at point blank, his chest made of Kevlar called out for medics, was met with the squad car, the white cop approached and unloaded. Yellow boy on the ground bleeding, and the face of my father crying on everyone's doorstep the following morning. When the SWAT team and white boy went home to their medals, we let go, let go, go. performers, but before we continue, I have to ask you to take this jar and pass it around the room, and if you have anything to donate to this wonderful event and the people that put it on, place it inside the jar, and then continue passing it until it reaches its home at the back of the room. Thank you in advance. Um, yeah, please donate if you can. This reading series is wonderful, and I'm so grateful to be part of it, and the artists are grateful to be here and to be supported and to have a place to, to read poems. So donate if you can. Um, oh, I had one other announcement, which is that um, right after this show, there's actually another reading. Um, today is the 150th anniversary of the largest mass execution in the history of the US. Um, it was the hanging of the 38 Dakota men in Mankato, Minnesota. Um, and tonight at 8.30, there are a group of Dakota writers coming to reflect and remember and share and speak on presence. So yeah, stay for that. That sounds great, and it's a good thing to remember and keep in mind uh, as we roll into the new year. So coming to the stage now, um, Laura Knuckles will be reading next. Uh, I love Laura Knuckles. I've known her since the fourth grade. Yeah. Um, but also, Laura Knuckles studies religion and creative writing at Oberlin College. She has trouble accept accepting some lost things cannot be found. Please welcome to the stage, Laura Knuckles. How are you guys doing? Good, how are you? Great. Good, thank you. Um, I am really excited to read because I had some delicious coffee from our very own Black Dog. And if you find yourself falling asleep in the next 10 to 20 minutes, you should definitely hit that up. <laughs> cool. The serpent had slithered up your sleeve to sleep when father came home, heard you speaking English. Did the couplet flee the fight, bite your blush and burrow into white flesh so sweet, so forbidden? Did the couplet find your core, your arsenic, laced seeds beating blood and adrenaline? It speaks beneath this purple-black blemish on your chest known by heart, or is this the echo of his curse word? Give a haiku, one imprint of inky blue fingertips, Eve, muse, newly mute, mate. You leave me breath and speechless. I'd eat his entire library for your land die. How do you guys feel about prose? Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. 
This is about um, a time I felt like I was a part of something in St. Paul. It's called Solidarity. It was midday when we carried our anger out of doors, out of the buses, off the trains, out of our cars from bikes and the soles of our sneakers. They were waiting there. They were waiting there because we had prophesied our own arrival on Twitter on our profiles from the rooftops of our lungs. We are coming. We can't hold back anymore. We're taking the capital. We'll see you at the summit. They wore riot gear, and so did we. Theirs was made from plastics and Kevlar. Ours was made from flannel and dyed. They had shields. We had signs made from paper and marker and middle fingers. Their helmets had blast guards. We dipped our bandanas in vinegar, yet they could still see our faces. No analogy armed us against their tear gas, concussion grenades, rubber bullets, guns, guns, guns. But in the beginning, there was the word, and the word was with us. We shouted the word. We were the word. Traffic came to a halt at an intersection where we made an early stand. The sun was hot, a line was drawn in the asphalt, and we crossed it. So they cut us apart and took some of us away in vans. The good thing about being on our side is that there is no rank and any of us can rise up at the right moment. After those arrests were over, we walked on. We still believe the streets belong to us, and we said so. Whose streets? Our streets. We shouted with one voice, answering and calling to our multiplied self. Oops. Our self filling four lanes for miles. The streets don't know who they belong to. They kissed our feet and gave us away. This is who we are. We are teachers, we are union workers, we are anarchists. There are women and children among us, we said. There are young and innocent people here. Someone in the crowd muttered, I want them to come in with all these little kids. Then we'd get on the news. Then they'd realize what they've been doing. How can you say that, said someone else. This is who we are. Young and innocent, vandals and addicts, murderers and mothers, we're old. We're exhausted of everything except our anger and love. Miles later, out of downtown, we traced the freeway through parking lots and residential neighborhoods and off the frontage road. The sun was going down and our permit had expired. The west side of the city was turning gold, the east purple black. Then the real violence started. We'd been walking for so long, but it was time to run. The thing news channels couldn't broadcast if TV had tried to tell this story is how loud it was. It was so loud. The volume in all the living rooms and sports bars across the country would have to get turned up by satellite. The news would have to break the stereos and shatter the screens. Once the flashbangs got going, we couldn't see or speak at a regular register. We shouted everything you said, are you OK? Come on, run. And we were losing our voices. A mounted cop spurred his horse right over this pudgy punk type guy. Um, those mounties would swoop in and out of the crowd like cowboys with an unruly herd. Maybe that guy got up, maybe not. No one saw, no one stopped to watch anyone get arrested anymore. It was happening on every block. And the tear gas clouds across the night, and the mace, concussion grenades and how we are all yelling nothing, then suddenly silent, just running, then screaming, who are you serving? Who are you protecting? It's amazing how easily they could direct us. We said we were the resistance movement, but when we turned a corner to find the line of guns, we'd find the path of least resistance. They even put up walls in places, little riot fences. Finally, they got the last of us, the fractured, frightened, and defiant us, us onto the bridge. The bridge. They were right behind us, and they were waiting for us. Up the other side, the freeway was below us, shining lights from north and south on us, and quickly passed. Run, die, jump, die. Their amplified voice told us, if you are on this bridge, you are under arrest. Sit down and put your hands on your head. 
There were so many of us, and though they had the greater firepower, they didn't have enough vans and handcuffs to take us all at once. So we sat on the bridge for hours and sang our songs. They were still about solidarity, but they weren't about overcoming anymore. There was no way out for us except in their possession. We were going to be individualized and processed our fingerprints. We'd each have a photo and a number and a file in their office downtown. I got my photo taken twice. Once at the bridge around midnight, right before they stuffed me in a van to struggle with my plastic tight cups. That first one, I remember catching a passing cop's eye. He was afraid to look at me, and when the camera flashed, I started to laugh. One of the kids put himself in the van, just to give them a little more trouble, I guess. <laughs> when we got to jail, it stopped being funny. They lined us all up, then took me, only me, into a back room for questioning. I don't remember the detective, and I don't remember what I said, but I remember I used first-person plural exclusive pronouns. He told me I could go, and I didn't see them ask anyone else to speak for us all. Their holding cells were beige-painted cement walls, nothing else but the names of people who came before. I was alone, one of the only girls, and I stretched out on my back on the floor, remembering ground. Then an anarchist chick got ushered in with me and I had to sit scrunched up again, hands on your head. She was afraid. She kept talking about killing herself. What was I supposed to say to that? No one plans for that in the manifestos. They took us through processing, name, address, social. The ink they used to take down our fingerprints was greasy and we had to use their gritty, industrial, orange-smelling soap to get it off. I took my picture again. <clears throat> Before they pack us onto another van to the cells where we'd sleep, they wanted to search us for weapons, drugs, whatever. Not like they'd find it. If we'd had what they wanted, we'd have already used it. Still, one of them led me away to a dark room, and he had me stand inside and take off my clothes. He'd be on the other side of the door, keeping it slightly ajar. I was supposed to pass all my stuff to him so he could look through it. I untied my shoes and handed him the right, then the left, then the socks. I took off my shirt and passed it out of sight. My bandana I abandoned during the run because I heard if they catch you with a bandana, they'll slap you with terrorism charges or something, somehow. I took off my pants, the pockets already emptied. Those I handed away too, and my bra covering my breasts with one arm. <clears throat> Come on, now, he said through the door. There was a two-way mirror, or a camera in there then, or he could see me standing, shaking in briefs in that dark, claustrophobic room, or he just assumed I hadn't already given him enough. So my underwear over my hips and legs gave them to that man with the gun outside. I was more naked than I'd ever felt waiting. called The Day I Learned the Smell of Your Blood. Before the day was known, I saw it on my pillowcase, bronze brazen, a guest who didn't call. Though you wouldn't wake, you lay listening for the ring. Through the glass in the morning, I could feel you hold knives the wrong way and right, cold tile clinging to fingertip memory. These stains come out in the laundry salty into soapy, water from wine. You are mine, but I sleep with only a speck of yours at my feet each night, remembering the day I began by cleaning blood from your face. This is my last poem. Thank you for having me. It's called Speaking of the Unspeakable. 
The deer follow different paths now, but they always could cover up their footsteps. They knew just where each leaf would rest, rust. It was all I could do to wait quietly, like church. But what did I know about angels moving? What I needed them most, they were nothing but rustling. That's when I learned about faith. God is dead. The deer have been making mazes around his grave. I have tried to follow them to the sanctum, but it shifted every time. In the spring, they'll start eating the roses rooted perennially in his empty mouth. I know, because when they at last pulled back the brush veil, their eyes were adjective, plural noun, past continuous. That changed me. some more for Laura. We have one more poet tonight, um, and then we are done reading poems. But uh, before that last poet, I'd just like to say thank you again for sharing tonight with us. Um, the last poet of the night will be Huey Wynn, um, who is a St. Paul native and currently works at a haberdashery. Please welcome to the stage, Huey. Hello, everybody. Hello. I'm going to do some poems for you guys. It's, it's not a laptop, it's not going to fall. <laughs> One, my mother and I don't have dinner table conversations out of courtesy. We don't want to remind each other of our accents, her voice, is a Vietnamese lullaby sung to an empty bed, the taste of her hometown still kicking in the back of her teeth. My voice is bleach. My voice has no history. My voice is the ringing of an empty picture frame, the frequency of a TV turned off, too. My birth name is Hugh Nguyen, but today I don't know myself as anything other than Huey, and Hugh is sitting in preschool trying to say the word orange, to say the word bathroom, to say home, to say friend, and today, I'm forgetting how to say the simple things to my mother. The words that linger in my periphery, it is rear view mirror dangling from the wires. I am only fluent in apologies, three. When I look at my childhood photos, the ones taken by my mother, I have to remind myself that in that moment, I understood her. That in that moment, I knew what she was saying. She was saying, smile, four. My mother's favorite television shows are all 90s sitcoms, the ones with laugh tracks, the pre-recorded emotion to cue her when to laugh five in the first grade. I mastered my tongue. I cleaned my speech, and during parent-teacher conferences, the teacher was surprised that my mother was Asian. She just assumed I was adopted. She assumed that this voice was the same one I started out with six sometimes. When I watch home movies, I don't even understand myself. My childhood is a foreign film. All of my favorite memories have been dubbed in English seven as she holds a pair of chopsticks. A friend asks me why I am using a fork. I tell her it's much easier. She says in the voice the same octave as my grandmother, she says, but this is so much cooler. Eight, I am a fortune cookie. I'm an American flag made in China. I am every pair of Nikes in my closet. I am Lian Chin. I am Panda Express. I am white paint. And I can still feel the brush strokes on the roof of my mouth. Nine. In Vietnamese, the name Hue means pious. It means understanding. It means tradition. It means devotion. In English, the name Huey means nothing. Ten. I've accepted the fact that I am no longer Vietnamese just Asian. I'm just the clip art. The poster boy of whitewash. My skin has been burning easier these days. My voice box is shrinking. I have rinsed it out too many times. My house is a silent film. My house is infested with subtitles. Eleven. That's all. That's all.
I have nothing else to say. So I'm gonna do a poem about my best childhood friend. Um, this is for Andrew. Your mind has been the smoky dishwater that held all the lost knives. No one brave enough to reach in, too afraid of which angle the blade might be sleeping. It is easy to forget the bad days, but easier to polish the good ones, to keep it fresh and fat like a newly cleaned room. Your mother asked you to stay regular on the pills, and you don't. Your pockets full of lint and wide eyes. Why would I swallow something that wouldn't even melt in the wash? You tell me that you are not a beanbag. You are a maraca. You shake your hips and ask us if we can hear the little rock skipping across your torso. It ripples my face into a smile like it's supposed to, and I know that this is another memory that I will save. Store it in our cheeks for the next time you forget to talk for four days. The only time you laugh is when you are present when your mind isn't holding its breath, they will wait for the murk to slowly drain away, for the smoke to lift its thumbs off your eyes before they can see that there was nothing dangerous waiting in the fog. They've hidden all of the sharp things and forgotten where they left them. It was the winter we learned how to properly smoke a cigarette, or it was a spring we found Brooke Parker's dog Mango after all the snow had melted. We decided that this neighborhood was too cement, too metal. There was too much gravel collecting inside the soles of our shoes. Sometimes we'd shake our sneakers and pretend we were somewhere exotic. After Daniel's funeral, we made a paper mache pinata out of the leftover programs. We filled it with dandelion seeds and tried to beat the wishes out of them. I think we were nine. I could be lying, but I distinctly remember you losing your last three baby teeth after your dad bounced your face off the garage door. Maybe it was just a very vivid dream. Nostalgia forgets to visit this street. It is too busy with tree houses and rope swings. It doesn't have time for all of this gray. All of my favorite memories are the ones away from home. I think, I think it was a summer I broke my wrist, or maybe it was a summer your mom started selling pot out of your basement, or maybe it was a summer of both. When we filled our backpacks with cereal and ran away to the playground three miles from home, I think we walked or biked, or maybe it was the summer you stole your parents' bright green Buick. We, we arrived to the sandbox and ran to the swing set out of habit. There was no rust there. I didn't believe I was swinging because I couldn't feel the scrape above my head. I couldn't feel the buzz of a saw blade. This land was too porcelain. In that foreign America, they must consider the dandelion a weed and not a bouquet of potential. I remember listening to the other children's voices as their porch lights beckoned them home for supper, ditching their mosquito halos by the tire swing, how they sounded like children, how they laughed and jumped and sang like children. I'm gonna do two more poems, is that okay? When I was three, I found a toothbrush in the trash. I picked it up, washed it off, and placed it back on the counter. Later that day, I found it on the bathroom floor, snapped at the neck. <laughs> when my mother told me you were leaving, I sat in the doorway, convinced you would come back. I was so sure. Last winter, I outgrew your jacket. The sleeves cut into my shoulders how your hands would, the way they gripped, I should have known you would outgrow this family. I was eight the last time I made a Father's Day card. I coated my hands in glue, peeled it off when it dried, stuffed the shreds of my palms in a mailbox. I didn't have your address. I was just hoping my hands just knew where they came from. 
I hope you got it. I hope it still knocks on your door. When I was 13, your brother brought me to your office. My coat thin and useless like a spineless umbrella, I left a trail of December straight to your desk. Your desk, cluttered with photos of your new family, they smile like they don't know where you came from. You wouldn't look at me. Your brother grabbed you by the shoulders and told you, look at him, look at him. When you were finally brave enough to face your haunting, brave enough to see the leftovers rotting inside our fridge, you looked at me like an empty wallet, like court papers hung up. At my high school graduation, my aunt told me that our voices were so similar. I began talking to myself, told myself how proud you were, told myself that you were coming back. I often wonder if I would be informed if you died. And what I just know, would it feel any different? I imagine your hearse, it looks like a moving truck, but this time, only one box. You haven't died yet. You live only three miles away, and sometimes I find myself driving down your street. I don't know what I'm looking for. It's hard to admit that I miss you. Every time I drop a football or nick myself shaving, there is still time for these lessons. I want you to teach me everything. Sometimes I find you next to me at a stoplight, and I want to cause a traffic jam. Sometimes. I hope you're not wearing your seatbelt. I hope the windshield will kiss your face like a dull razor, the road, arms open and ready to catch. But sometimes, I imagine that we are in the same car, just heading home. Thank you, guys. This is going to be my last poem. After we put my grandmother to sleep in an incinerator, they returned her to us in a tin cube along with a plastic bag full of things that refused to melt. Nails, screws, a titanium kneecap. Her wedding ring, still solid, was placed in the urn surrounded by her dust, her, and I thought skin was the only thing holding one's body together. She sat on her bookshelf for months, not sure what to do with our beloved debris, what mountain or gust of wind, what seaside cliff or bathroom drain, whose lungs would take her on a grand adventure. Most of her jingling joints kept in a Ziploc bag like bullets serving no purpose outside of a body. It took my mother eight years to accept me for being gay. For eight years, I sat and watched my house burn. I watched her save the baby photos, but leave the baby. I know I should be grateful that she came around at all, that she forgave. I've been told that it's not her fault. It's how she was raised. I've been told that it's our family's old way of thinking. I've been told to forgive this stubborn inheritance, this thing has lived inside her body and her mother's and her mother's father. I've been told that once you've been stabbed, it is better to leave the blade inside the body. Removing the dagger will only open the wound further. Forgiveness will bleed you thin if you ignore it. Your skin could close around the metal. This is a part of you now. This is all you will find when my body crumbles. This vengeful child, this shiny grudge, a 13-year-old boy crawling from the ashes, holding a gas can in his hands. Gorgeous.
please feel free to come take a look at this beautiful artwork. And thank you again. A round of applause, please, for the artists and all the artists tonight.